But today, if you got a Bible, let's go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter two, Revelation chapter three. Can I go ahead and just tell you the assignment that God has given me today? As we are in the final message of our series called We the Church, I wanna invite you back next weekend, Mother's Day, as we honor mothers and also pray for mothers that are going through some difficult seasons. My wife will be preaching that message. I will be here cheering my bride and the mother to our four children on, amen and shouting and taking notes. She comes to deliver a message and I believe it'd be worth you coming next weekend as we honor mothers in the house, but also, I just want to say that today's message is probably one of the most important messages I could preach in 2024 right now. And God's given me fire in my bones. I just got back from Turkey a couple weeks ago, and I want to speak to the seven churches of Revelation. I did this at the men's conference, and our, our fellas, some, some of our warriors were like, Ed, you got to preach that back at church. And so I listened to you, men. Holy Spirit of God confirmed it. I'm going to preach all seven of the churches of Revelation. I just want to go ahead and give the disclaimer. It took me an hour and five minutes to preach it last night. It took me about an hour to preach it this morning at eight. I'm trying to somehow whittle it down because we had a 12 o'clock service and a two o'clock service and I'm wasting words right now. So I just need to go ahead. <laughs> if I could just get into Revelation chapter two, I'm just giving you a warning that we're going to cover all seven churches in one sermon. Let me tell you why this matters because the images on the screen behind me, can you see these? These images behind me, they're actual ruins of the seven churches that I walked in, taking nearly 50 people. When we take these Bible trips, listen, I'm preaching the Bible, helping people understand that the Bible comes alive when we go into these places. But when we walked in these places, it was a reminder, it was a prophetic word, Ed, if the church doesn't listen to the Holy Spirit of God, stand on the word of God, then the hand of God comes off the church of God and it goes from being a movement to a monument or a museum. And I pray to God, 200, 300, 400 years of Jesus tarries, that this church will be standing strong. It's got a solid foundation in who Christ is, the power of the Holy Spirit, founded by Pastor Robert Emmett that loved God, handed the baton to me. I'm gonna run hard for 25 years. I'm gonna hand this thing off to somebody else, somebody younger and cooler along the way. But I'm gonna tell you this, I know this to be true. I know this to be true. That if we'll just keep our eyes on the prize of who Jesus is, stand on the principles of God's word, believe in the power of the Holy Ghost, that he could do signs, wonders, and miracles, and God will allow this church not to be a, mu a museum or a monument, but a movement of God that will outlive each and every one of us. Here's the reason why, because you got a generation of people coming behind you. What are we leaving behind? What are we leaving in them? And the church of Revelation, seven churches, speaks prophetically, practically, and personally. Now, if you got a Bible, Revelation chapter two, but I want to give you point number one. In point number one, I want you to see the exaltation of Jesus over the church. Now, in every letter to the seven churches of Revelation, Jesus begins with an introduction. He begins with his credentials. How many of you are like me? When you go into a medical office, you look for degrees. Can I get a witness from somebody? <laughs> Before you go out to a restaurant, you're checking Yelp. Some of you old school people, you're checking Travelocity. <laughs> All right? But what you do is you, you, you need credentials. You, you go into an auto mechanic or you maybe go get your vehicle service. You need to see trophies. You need to see awards. You need to see certificates. You, you need to see something that would authenticate and validate that this person knows what they're doing. Can I get, come on, am I talking to somebody? Jesus goes, can I just begin with all of my credentials? And I just want to read through these quickly, all seven churches. He gives one sentence statements of his credentials, and it's point number one, we see the exaltation of Jesus over the church. Revelation chapter two, verse one, to the church of Ephesus, he says, to the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. The stars speak in reference to the messengers or the pastors of those churches. Great news, I'm preaching this to myself. Thank you, Jesus, that you hold me in your hand. Thank you, Jesus, that you hold the seven golden lampstands. That the seven golden lampstands is the completion. The number seven is completion. The golden lampstands are the churches. But we see the second introduction to the church of Smyrna. Revelation chapter two, verse eight. It says, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. It's in Revelation chapter one, verse eight. You hear that he's the alpha, the omega, who was, who is, and is to come, the Lord God Almighty. 
We understand that he is the first, the last, the beginning, the end, the in-between, everything you need is in his hands. He speaks that to the church of Smyrna. Here's an, another church, the church of Pergamum. He says the words, this is Revelation chapter two, verse 12, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. You go, Ed, that sounds a little scary. Well, the sharp two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the word of God. When Jesus comes back, by the way, can we just agree to this fact? Jesus is coming again. There's nothing holding back Jesus from coming. Anybody else ready for his return? Anybody else waiting for the moment where he blares the trumpet and the dead in Christ rise and those of us that are alive in the air will be caught up with him to go rule and reign with him forever? When Jesus comes back in Revelation chapter 19, he's riding a white horse. First time he came, he came riding a donkey in humility. The second time he comes back, he's riding the war horse. And out of his mouth is the sword of the Lord. And we see that he would speak to the church of Pergamum with those words. The church of Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2 verse 18 says, The words of the Son of God. Interesting, Thyatira. Specifically, they were worshiping a god, lowercase g god, by the name of Apollo. Known as the sun god. S U N. But watch what Jesus is. The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I think this is a great moment for me to say the reason why Jesus introduces his credentials is because every statement of his certificate of authentication or validation, the veracity and the authority of who he is, is inextricably connected to what's going on in the context. Can I say that a little simpler? That every time he introduces himself, he's actually by his own character, the nature of who he is, he's actually dealing with something that's going on in culture. How many of you know this? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he speaks, he speaks an on-time word. He speaks to what's going on around us and amongst us. He's not aloof sitting in some rocking chair distant from humanity. He knows what's going on. He knows what we need today. And he speaks to the church of Thyatira and he says, I'm the one with eyes like a flame of fire. For some of you, you're going, that sounds like Superman, just better. He's got x-ray vision. Let me tell you why that matters. Because some of you are going through some stuff right now. Some of you are facing some stuff. And I'm looking around the room. I'm trying to make some, some facial recognition just looking at some people, you sit in the same seats, you're creatures of habit. I know when you're here and when you're not here, I'm taking attendance, all right? And so, <laughs> but I'm looking at some faces right now and you need to hear this. If he's got eyes like a flame of fire and he's got x-ray vision, he knows right where you're at and what you're going through. I need you to know nothing goes unnoticed. On the other side of this, it goes from a word of, of encouragement. It also can sound a little scary. You're like, whoa, he's got x-ray vision. He knows what's going on. He know what I did last night? Yeah. He knew, what you, he, he knew what you said this week. He knew how you acted this week. But can I give you good news? You're fully known, but at the same time, fully loved. Can we clap to that? Would that be all right? Just fully known and fully loved. Eyes like a flame of fire. Then we jump into chapter three. Y'all still with me? Say amen. Come on, I'm working through this. The seven spirits. Revelation chapter three, verse one. He speaks to the church of Sardis, to the, wor the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What's the seven spirits? You're like, Ed, that sounds a little spooky. Like, what is that? Like real mystical. The number seven is the number of completion. It's speaking of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse two is the verse that just percolates in my mind right now that the dimensions of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, under count, uh, counsel, excuse me, wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, power, insight, might, and the fear of the Lord. Everything that you need is in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that when Jesus came back from the dead, it was the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the moment you gave your life to Jesus, your body became the temple of the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you read the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit that speaks to you. I believe in the Holy Spirit is alive and active today. Just like when I read the book of Acts and I see the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit of God is looking for vessels that are empty that we can be filled up by the power of the Holy Spirit and overflow the good 
goodness of God through a reality that he gave us power, love, and self-control by the dimensions of the Holy Spirit that we can produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control through the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything you need is in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the words of the Ghostbusters, we ain't scared of no ghost. Amen. Got to move on. As we think about the power of the Holy Spirit, it leads now to the church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. When we hear this statement, the credentials of Jesus, he's got the keys. He is the one who holds the keys of David. How many of you know this? When Jesus defeated sin, death, and hell, Satan had the keys over sin, death, and hell as Jesus in that moment laid in that grave. But the moment when that stone rolled away and Jesus walked out of that grave, in between in those three days, he went down to hell and started preaching. Come on, somebody. He went down to hell, started preaching, and grabbed the keys back from Satan. And guess what? And because he's got the keys, he opens up every door for you that you cannot open on your own. And he keeps doors open that other people, hello, that try to shut them on you. I'm just telling you, my Jesus has got the keys. He's got authority. Can we clap to that? Come on, help me preach today. He's got the keys. He's got the keys. And then we see the church of Laodicea. The words of the amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Can I teach you some sign language today? Why don't you put your hand out? Why don't you make a rock fist on the count of three? Bring this fist down to your hand. That's the word amen. One, two, three. Let's make it again. One, two, three. Jesus goes, I'm the amen. One more time. One, two, three. In Spanish, amen. Amen. <laughs> I got my guayabete on right now. They're just kind of letting y'all know it's Cinco de Mayo. Come on. Just let you know I got, I, got real, I got real Spanish right there for a second. Come on, pray for this gringo pastor trying to learn some Spanish. But he said, I am the amen, the faithful and true witness. We understand the faithful, true witness. Jesus begins to speak. And when he begins to speak, now let me just go ahead and give you, can I just tell you that this week when I was writing this sermon, it felt good, and then when I started preaching this, I was like, man, these points got me handcuffed. So can I just give you point two, three, and four all in one moment? Thank you for saying yes. Point number two, <laughs> I want you to write down the word correction. Correction. We see the correction of Jesus towards the church that sin replaces. How many of you know this? That any time we go away from the abundant life that God wants to give us, that will forever satisfy us, and we try to do things on our own, we are replacing the goodness of God for the things of this world, and that is fulfilling legitimate needs in illegitimate ways, and it's replacing what God wants to give us. That's what sin does. It's the replacement of what God gives us. We see that he corrects the church. Jesus is about to get up close and personal into the church as he addresses some issues. Point number three, write this down. We see the affirmation of Jesus about the church. There are only two churches, you'll notice this, there are only two churches that do not get criticized. Five get corrected, two get edified. Of the seven, you'll notice Smyrna and Philadelphia are encouraged. Point number four, write this down. We see the invitation of Jesus towards the church. What's the invitation of Jesus towards the church? Get right, repent. The word repent means change directions. Have a change of mind, watch this. Have a change of mind and let your feet match what your mind is telling you. Anytime you and I go in the wrong direction, we got a gracious, loving, kind, benevolent God that leads us, his kindness leads us to repentance. When we choose to stop replacing God's provision with the sinfulness of our actions and our attitudes, then God goes, repent, I'll take you back. Aren't you grateful? Somebody just needs to thank God for a God that gives us second chances and third chances and fourth chances. First John 1, 9 is percolating in my mind. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. No sin Jesus can't forgive. But I gave you point two, three, and four, but let me just put this together. We saw the exaltation of Jesus over the church. Can I tell you who, this, who, who owns this church? It ain't Ed. It's not the board of directors. Pastor Robert doesn't own the church. Let me tell you who owns the church. Jesus owns this church. The power of the Holy Spirit resides in this church amongst you, amongst me, and we're believing for the so much more. 
But as we think about who is reigning over the church, Jesus, but as we think about the criticism or the correction that Jesus gives us, I want to talk to us about how he corrects five churches and he compliments two churches. Y'all still with me? Say amen. Come on, we're covering a lot of ground, hopscotching through the passages. But as we look at at the city of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. Go back with me if you don't mind. Revelation chapter two, verse four. This was the criticism towards Ephesus. I got this against you. By the way, that doesn't start well, does it? I got this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. What does he say to the church of Ephesus? If you were to read Revelation chapter two, all the way down to verse seven, you'll find out that Jesus looks at the church of Ephesus and he goes, you know what? Y'all are so devoted, so disciplined, so, so committed to doctrine. You don't let false teachers get in, but you know what he was speaking to? He was speaking to a legalistic church. He was speaking to a church that had forgotten what it was like to be lost. You know what I mean by that? See, if we're not careful, I've I've been a Christian for over 30 years, and what happens, let me just use this example, you've been walking with Jesus for so long, you forget what it's like for somebody to begin a relationship with Jesus that's a little bit raw, that doesn't know how to talk correctly. Sometimes language gets a little loose. Or, or, or maybe they're in the tension of, I used to do these things, but now Jesus changed my life. And man, I still feel the pull and the tension of those things. And so they're wrestling and they're working through this new life in Christ and what they've been delivered from. And a church that gets real legalistic just looks at the external and not at the heart. Judges people based upon the external. Aren't you grateful we got a God that doesn't look at the outside but looks at the inside? And by the way, we're all still a work in progress. Ain't nobody up in here final and complete. God's still working on us. But the church of Ephesus had lost its first love. It got real legalistic and actually quite prideful in their devotion. You'll you'll notice that they're doing all the right things, the what, but they forgot the who. It was about Jesus. How many of you know this? You can work for Jesus, but not work with Jesus. You can do a lot of things in his name, but not be empowered by his name. And you and I have to understand it. Maybe this illustration will make sense. There's a sweet couple been married over 65 years, driving an old school pickup truck. I'm talking about just a single bench seat. She was sitting up against the window and he was driving. They pulled up to a red light. And there was another pickup truck in front of them and a sweet young couple sitting so close they looked like one. And all of a sudden, she said this, this sweet woman of God that had been married over 65 years, she looked at her husband and said, I remember when we used to sit like that. <laughs> and this old country fella, 10 and two, just looking straight ahead, didn't even acknowledge. And then he said this, he goes, I never moved. never moved. I remember when I've been here the whole time. You're the one that slid over to the window. You say, Ed, why'd you tell us that story? Church of Ephesus. Jesus never moved. They just kept moving further and further and further away from their first love. As we think about the church of Pergamum, church, or excuse me, church of Smyrna, you'll hear this accusation towards the church. As we think about, excuse me, it is the church of Pergamon. We'll see this in verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. And then verse 15, you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. You go, Ed, what was the criticism again? Pergamum was a church that had become worldly. Now, let me define that because oftentimes church has a tendency to define worldly as by the way we dress or the music we listen to or the places we go. Worldly, by definition, is being unequally yoked. That we got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. That that we've learned how to act one way here and another way outside of here. That's worldly. That, That we find our value, our significance, our esteem, our significance from the standpoint of 
what, what it means to have a form of acceptance by what the world says that we got to do. And so we seek to measure according to the standards of the world. And then Jesus has got a different way that we're called to live. What we do has to match what we do out there. See, character is who you are when nobody's watching, but biblical character is who you are when Jesus is watching, which by the way, he's watching at all times. So there's consistency. But you hear about the church of Pergamum, there were two false doctrines. I don't have time to completely elaborate on this, but let me speak to it. Balaam, there was a false prophet that was a prophet for hire. He was seeking to gain prosperity. King of Moab hired out Balaam to curse the nation of Israel. He opens up his mouth instead of cursing coming because if he curses Israel, he gets paid. But every time he opened his mouth, curses didn't come out, blessing came out. So in order to get the nation of Israel to be cursed, here's what he does. He gets the Moabite women who are worshiping other gods to marry the Israelite men that turn their hearts away from Yahweh God, Adonai God, Elohim God. And so you can see unequally yoked. In that moment, the doctrine of Balaam is actually a teaching that says in sexual immorality, you can live however you want to live. Which, by the way, is crazy because in Bible times, these temples that were dedicated to different gods, the way you worship those gods, lowercase g gods, was to actually have a sexual relationship with the cult prostitutes. That's how you worship those gods. And that had crept into the church, that there was no sexual purity inside the church. And let me just define sexual purity. Sexual immorality is anything, any, any form of sexual activity, physically and mentally and visually, outside of the context of marriage between man and woman. Let me just be even more clear. Pornography, lustfulness, Cohabitation, homosexuality, the Bible calls sin. And when this doctrine of Balaam began to infiltrate into the church, the pastors and the leaders did not confront it. The Nicolaitans, that teaching of the Nicolaitans, that word Nike, it's a Greek word to conquer or to have victory. There was a false teaching in the church that said that you can live however you want to live. Jesus has forgiven you of all your sin. Did you hear that? It's the fact that Christ has died for all your sin, so just live life to the fullest, live in indulgence. It doesn't matter what you do in here or outside of here, but the church of Pergamum had become so corrupt that there was no sexual purity inside the church. I think it's interesting, anytime demonic activity begins to infiltrate a nation or a church or a people group, it has something to do with a form of sexual perversion. But when you and I understand Pergamum, it it leads us actually to Thyatira and somehow it's still connected because the church of Thyatira was not worldly like Pergamum, but the church of Thyatira was a church that actually was tolerant. Tolerance was the message. So Thyatira here in Revelation chapter two, verse 20, it says, but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, hello, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols. You go, Ed, what is Jezebel doing in Revelation chapter two? I thought she was in the Old Testament. There was a king by the name of Ahab and Ahab had a wicked wife by the name of Jezebel that turned the hearts of the nation of Israel away from once more Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai God to Baal. Baal demanded child sacrifice. Baal was worshipped by going to the high places, to the Asherah poles that actually were, were sexual perversions of statues and therefore once more engaging in sexual activity. It was Jezebel that would be of major discouragement to Elijah, that he actually would find himself afraid of her and now the Bible uses Jezebel not as a real person but as a spirit, Jezebel spirit. She was platformed in the church. The pastor didn't do anything to confront it. She was given a form of influence. She used a form of seduction and manipulation and made it seem as if she had the ability to have divine revelation 
download it to her and it was her job to translate it to everybody else because she was a prophetess. But I need you to know that Jezebel's spirit was not godly and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It's not the fact that women can't teach. I want you to hear me understand something. My wife will teach the Bible next weekend, but she's not the pastor of this church. She's under the authority of me as the pastor of not only our home, but also this church as the spiritual leader. Women have the ability to teach and have giftings to expound and pontificate. But in the church of CBC, its spiritual headship has to be male represented. That's not chauvinistic. That's Bible. But when we talk about headship, it doesn't mean that women are less than, they're equal. We have different roles and responsibilities. I'm going to, listen, I ain't said this in any other service, but I think it's important you understand it because I get a couple comments every time my wife preaches and I need you to understand it hurts because I'm going to sit on this front row and preach and teach. She's doing this not because she's asked for it. She's doing this because I asked her to preach. And let me tell you why. Because when it's Mother's Day, you don't need me up here. And there'll be times I preach on Mother's Day, but you need to hear from a mama. You need to hear from a woman of God that loves Jesus. So let me be real clear. My wife's not the pastor of the church. I am. She's coming underneath my authority. And I need you to know that the church of Thyatira had a Jezebel spirit and they let her lead the church and she was leading it in the wrong direction. And the manifestation of miracles and signs and wonders as she self-proclaimed prophetess wasn't from the Lord, it was demonic. And a Jezebel spirit can get up in a church at any moment. Let me tell you what it does. It's a, it's a, it's a spirit of I'm better than, I got divine revelation and it downloads to me and you are lesser than. And the reason why it's important you say this out loud, Pastor Ed, right now, let me tell you why. I'm preaching to myself. is because there are people that are listening to a lot of false teachers and you don't even know it. You're listening to a lot of people that are not teaching you the whole counsel of God. They make it seem as if they have a divine revelation that you're not able to get. And I need you to know that's not what the Bible teaches. You got everything you need for life and godliness through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. My job as a pastor is to show you, guide you, and hopefully lead by example how to walk this thing out. I'm no different from you. I don't got more of the Holy Spirit than you, God. I got the same Holy Ghost you got. And if you're young, you don't got a junior version of the Holy Spirit. You got the same Holy Spirit that the disciples have. You got the same Holy Spirit that all the apostles had. You got the same Holy Spirit of these men and women of God in the Bible. And you and I got the same Holy Spirit living inside of us. But the church of Pergamum and the church of Thyatira, I believe is a descriptor of the church of today. It's worldly and it's tolerant. It doesn't preach truth sometimes. But I got to speak to Sardis because then I'm going to bring this together. Y'all still listening? Come on, help me. I want you to listen to Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. It says, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Verse 2, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. It's interesting that, that when Jesus compliments the church, he talks about the seven-fold witness of the Holy Spirit. The church of Sardis was dead. The spirit had left the building. A.W. Tozer, you've probably not heard of A.W. Tozer, famous, famous dead guy who's in heaven. We're gonna get a chance to meet him, but he said some really cool things when he lived on this earth. He said, Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them. Hello. But then he also said this. He said, most churches, he said, 95% of churches alive today, the Holy Spirit has left and they don't even know it because it's just business as usual. For some of you, you're hearing this probably because some video's going viral, but I started praying three years ago. Mama, you good? You all right? Okay, all right, just making sure you're good, all right? (laughs) Revelation chapter three helps us understand that the the need for the Holy Spirit, I started praying a couple years ago. I had a real encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit three years ago, believing in signs and wonders and miracles. God began to activate something in my wife and I's heart. We're longing for the more. We're not gonna fake the Holy Spirit here. We're not gonna fight the Holy Spirit here. This church is founded upon grace and truth. This this church is founded upon truth and the spirit of God working together. But the church of Sardis was living in a former glory. As an evangelist, I went to a lot of churches as I traveled 200 days a year for 13 years. And all I would hear sometimes as I walked into a church, as I was there for five days for revival services, they would tell me that, that the glory days were in the 70s. The glory days were in the 80s. 
The glory days were in the 90s and they would, they would talk about all the things that used to happen. I just said, dear God, a church living in the past. But you wanna do something fresh and new today. You're doing a new work, but that new work is not by a new word or a new spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same word. And as we contextualize this, we have to understand that the church of Sardis was a part of a town that actually was defeated because the watchman on the wall fell asleep. And I believe the word of the Lord has just put this deep inside my soul. And I got to say this today is that the church of Pergamum and the church of Thyatira that had false doctrine on the inside of it, coupled with the church of Sardis that the watchman fell asleep at the wall, has brought a tremendous amount of conviction in my heart that we gotta be a church that preaches the whole counsel of God even when the word of God stands against culture. Culture does not define my Bible, my Bible defines culture. And if I'm going to be a watchman on the wall and we got so many pastors and so many community group leaders that are teaching the Bible, by the way, anybody that teaches the Bible here has to actually go through a leadership course to make sure we are equally yoked on how we teach this Bible. You don't get to have private interpretation. You don't get to say you got special revelation. It's got to line up with the theological doctrinal stance that we have at this church. If not, you'll be corrected. You'll be asked to step down from leadership. You'll be warned. If not, if you continue and persist, we'll take the platform from you. We ain't playing. I just need you to know, Jesus said, I hold the seven stars. I hold the seven churches. And we want Jesus to have his hand of blessing on this church. But I'm telling you, if we ain't careful in 2024, I believe the hand of God will start coming off churches if we do not hold tight to the doctrine that's being taught. By the, by the way, I want you to listen to me. Any, any other message besides Jesus is the only way to heaven, any other message of Jesus plus something else is a false gospel. If the reward of following Jesus is what this world has to offer you, then it's a false gospel. It's not follow Jesus and he gives you all this stuff. He's the stuff. He's the reward. Seek him first. He gives you these things. But if you chase these things and add Jesus to it, false gospel. Jesus plus nothing is everything. And as we stand on that promise, the word of God from cover to cover, we don't get to cut out sections that disagree with our life. What's so crazy is so many people will be like, hey, listen, the Bible's filled with contradictions. Actually, the opposite is true. It's because it contradicts your life. It's just so much easier for you to start cutting out pages of the Bible. But we're gonna take the whole counsel of God, know that the breath of God is on it from Genesis to Revelation. We're gonna preach this whole Bible. Even when it feels uncomfortable, we're gonna say, thus saith the Lord. But I gotta say something because the political climate of today is changing. And let me preface something because so many times when we start talking about issues like this, there's so many people that go, Ed, why you gotta get political? Let me clarify something. When the government, and I'm talking about our government, and it's not just been happening in recent years, it's been happening. There's an undercurrent of what's taking place. It's no different from Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they were deported to Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar tried to change the language and the literature and change their names. There is an infiltration and you don't even know it if you're not paying attention to it. It's so subtle. It's in our music. It's in our movies. It's in our education. And then the moment some moms and dads who love Jesus start holding some people accountable in the educational system, then all of a sudden the government wants to call them terrorists. All the while we got campuses being overrun by a group of people that by the way are exercising nothing but hate. Peacefully protest, but don't hurt people. All the while buildings are being burnt down on college campuses or being overrun. There's other college campuses that are experiencing revival and people are coming to know Jesus on some college campuses. But I'm going to say something. I, I got to say this. I got to say this. Because when we talk about these issues, so many times people are like, Ed, why you got to get all political? Let me say something. And I just need to clarify this. Because I'm so convicted, I got, I got fire in my bones about this. The moment our government starts trying to legislate morality and spirituality, it no longer is a political conversation. 
It's a church house conversation. And what you have to understand, so I, I say this in love, please hear my heart, and I'm, try, I'm trying to lower my tone because I can get real passionate. I'm trying to lower my tone. So, so don't come at me and tell me the church has got political. No, the government tried to get moral and spiritual and they stepped into a space where thus saith the Lord and you don't, the government doesn't get to rewrite morality and spirituality. And when you cross over into that line, then the watchman on the wall has got to say something. That the watchman on the wall, and not just me, but other people, here's the reason why. My loyalty ain't to no donkey. My loyalty ain't to no elephant. My loyalty is to a lamb who ain't up for vote, who rules and reigns. And the moment you cross over and you start trying to stand in opposition to the Bible, then I got to say, thus saith the Lord. I got to stand on these promises and people will come and go up out of here. I promise you. We ain't trying to grow no crowd. We're trying to make disciples. And somehow we're going to walk this tight rope of unity because what, what the government and what the talking pundits want to do is cause us to be in opposition to each other. So here's what they're doing, just creating dumpster fires along the way, putting it out with their version of what the solution is. The only solution for the world that's burning around us is Jesus. He's the only solution. His word is true. And Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis, worldly, tolerant, and dead. So we got to be a church that takes this Bible and goes, thus saith the Lord, and love people that don't understand who God is. So when it comes to marriage, man and woman, when it comes to gender, male and female, when it comes to sexuality, man, woman, in the context of marriage. As we talk about life, life begins at conception. Listen to me, there's a, lo there's a lot of conversation and we'll continue to have this conversation, but we gotta protect the voice of the voiceless while still caring for mama. We, we got to help people understand that there's a God that's got a solution for all that's happening in the world. You can't remove God from it and then try to legislate morality and spirituality without God. And watch this, that politics, if we want to say actually the church has now all of a sudden become political. No, no, no. Actually, politics have tried to become religious. Somebody needs to, y'all need, need to quote that one right there. Is, 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 when the, is, is when government tries to legislate religion. You go, Ed, what about separation of church and state? So glad you asked that question. Because when the United States of America founded in its original documents a Judeo-Christian nation, it was a separation from the tyranny of a king that was corrupted by a pope. And what they had done is in the intermingling of a king and a pope working together to legislate morality and spirituality, then the founding fathers of our nation said, let the government be the government and speak to the, the needs of the people, but let the pope be the pope and speak to the spirituality. You cannot intermingle those things and let those become its own religion. And that's what's happened. As now... We got a choice. Does the church remain silent? Not here at CBC. I just need you to know because I believe the greater tragedy is that the world is dealing with these issues and we acting like it ain't even happening. I think there's a younger generation. For some of you, you've already made up your mind on how the world's living and what's going on, but there's a younger generation that's like, would somebody tell us the truth? Would somebody have enough backbone and courage to stand up in front of folks and just say, hey, listen, What's the Bible say? And have a, have a steel rod in your spine and let courage be inspirational and let people know, hey, listen, we, we could debate and discuss this thing and I have a call of God to love and to love well, but at the same time, not compromise my truth at the same time. Because here's the truth of the matter. We live in a world that doesn't even believe in truth. What's true for you may not be true for me. And then all of a sudden, here's what we got. And then we got no truth. Let me tell you what happens. When there is no truth and there's chaos, and that's exactly what's happening right now in the world, utter chaos. But what if I were to tell you the reason why God called you salt and the reason why God called you light is instead of turning on the news and getting discouraged, 
You can turn on the news and go, listen, man, this, this is getting tough, but what a day to be alive. What a day to be a part of a church that wants to change the world and help people be united, not divided, to find healing and not separation, not brokenness, but unity. The answer, Jesus. But God's looking for some radical people, much like the church of Philadelphia, much like the church of Smyrna that went through trial and tribulation, two quotes, Antipas was killed in Pergamum. And here's what he said, as they told him, bow the knee and confess Caesar is Lord. You know what he said? We'll do it. Jesus is Lord. And in that moment, they threw him into a brass bowl, lit some wood on fire, and he was going to die inside a brass bowl that continued to get hotter and hotter and hotter. They said, Antipas, just confess Caesar is Lord. Won't do it. Jesus is Lord. And Antipas, here's the record. In that moment, they said, all these false teachers said to him, the whole world is against you, Antipas. And I love what Antipas said. It feels so 300 right now. He goes, he goes then Antipas is against the whole world. You know what he was saying? I'm not going to live for the applause of people. I'm going to live for the applause of one person. When I see him face to face, Jesus is going to go, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We got to live for one applause. It's Jesus. One applause. Polycarp, another guy, Smyrna. Polycarp said this when they, when they were literally burning him alive. He said these words out loud. He goes, I have been serving my Jesus for 86 years and he's been nothing but good to me. How can I deny him now? He dies. I need you to know, come on, let me go Cinco de Mayo on you. Mexican proverb, the moment the trial and tribulation comes, here's the Mexican proverb, when they thought that they buried you, actually they didn't realize this, they just planted you like seed. See, the blood of the martyr is seed for revival. Revival is breaking out all over the world in places where there's persecution and poverty. Underground church in China, they can't stop it. You can have a communist party, they can't stop the underground church. They're locking up pastors in prison and here's what they don't realize, they think this is gonna discourage the church from meeting but actually it just gets bigger. So you can't stop this movement. People have tried to do it for 2,000 years. We're here. You can read a lot of articles. Christianity is dying. The church is dying. Not here. We stand on these promises. And Jesus reminds us. He reminds us that he is faithful. And when we hear the message of the Lord, specifically to Laodicea, he goes, you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. See, it doesn't make sense when you, when you hear it the way I've heard it my whole life, like Jesus just wants you to be hot or cold and cold being like not in love with Jesus, kind of just not on fire for Jesus. So just be cold or hot, just don't be in between. But actually that's a misunderstanding of the text. If you're gonna go to Laodicea with me, we'll stand in between the hot springs of Heropolis and the cold springs that come through Colossae and Laodicea had no water source and they were right in the middle and the water was aqueduct in. Hot water became lukewarm water. Cold water became lukewarm water. What Jesus was saying is there's value and benefit in hot water. There's value and benefit in cold water. Be hot or cold, be useful, purposeful, meaningful, significant, but don't stand in the middle and be lukewarm. That's what he was saying to the church of Laodicea. Come back to the source. And in the process of this blessing, here's what Jesus would say as he's calling out sin, he's confronting issues. It reminds me of my father. Can I, can I just say this to you? My father who's in heaven right now, he would say this to me a couple years ago. He said, son, I, I remember when I was dragging my trash can around. He said, it just it happened. I drug my trash can around for three miles. I was like, dad, my dad and I were laughing. He's deaf and he's like, didn't know I was dragging my trash can around for three miles. My question was like, dad, why not my marker two or my marker four? Or what, what happened? He goes, I was driving around. Folks were just waving Orlando, Florida. He's like, I just thought everybody was nice. I'd wave back. They'd wave and <laughs> they'd point. I'd point like, you the man, you know, you know, you the man. And he finally, he said, I got to, got to a red light and this dude is like pointing and he's like pointing back, waving, waving back. And then all of a sudden he gets out of the car. My dad's like, I, I thought he was going to fight me. And I didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden he gets out of the car and he points over top the roof of the car. And he's like, 
And he starts pointing and then my dad gets out and he'd been driving around, not a trash can you get from Lowe's and Home Depot. I'm talking about like the city given trash can. <laughs> and let me just say this to you today, this message, let me tell you what this message is. Because sometimes you don't know it. You don't know what you're dragging around because you can't hear it. But when you tune your ear to the spirit of the Lord, all the spirit of God does, and sometimes through a preacher standing on stage is going, warning, and you start pointing. So when we ask the question, looking at these seven churches, five of which are criticized, two are complimented, have we left our first love? Are we worldly? Are we tolerant? Are we spiritually dead? Are we lukewarm? Or are we like the church of Smyrna that was favored, the church of Philadelphia that had perseverance? But I wanna give you this last point. We see the glorification of Jesus towards the church. Now what I'm gonna do is every church, every church, that Jesus speaks to, that gives an opportunity to respond. He gives a reward if they will turn back to him. In Revelation chapter two, verse seven, he goes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. For those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, the tree of life is eternal life. When you see the church of Smyrna, here's the reward. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church is the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. You go, Ed, what's the second death? Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. You're like, yo, Ed, no time for riddles right now. Born once, physically, die twice. Physically and spiritually separated in a place called hell. You're born physically, born spiritually. Then death is not your final death. That is, you will die physically, but you won't die spiritually, that you will be in the presence of Jesus forever. My, my encouragement, be born twice. You already got one, be born again today be born again today. It's here in the church of Pergamum. Here's the invitation to the one who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna. You know what that means? That Jesus is the bread of life and he'll satisfy you though this world will leave you hungry. He goes, I'll give you him. I'll give him the white stone. You know what the white stone is? Biblically, we would understand in a court of law, there'd be a jury. And when the jury voted, you know what they handed? If the person was guilty, they would hand forth a black stone. If the person was innocent, he gives the white stone. You know what Jesus says? Not only do I give you a hidden manna, here's the reward of following Jesus, but I have put a white stone over your life, not guilty. Do you know that those who compete in those Athenian games or these Olympic games, the victor was given a white stone to come to a banquet feast. I need you to know that Jesus gave you a white stone and one day there's going to be a wedding supper of the lamb where Jesus sits at the head of the table and we get to dine and eat with our warrior and our king and our Lord and Savior. It's the white stone of forgiveness. Can I speak this over somebody's life? Not guilty. He goes on to say in the church of Thyatira, he says, even in the, in the confrontation, he goes in verse 26, the one who conquers, I'll keep, who keeps my works to the end, I will give them authority over the nations. He will rule with them with a rod of iron, with earth and pots are broken in pieces. Even myself have received authority from my father. I will give him the morning star. You'll rule with him. You'll, you'll rule with him. You go, Ed, what, what is that talking about? I don't have time to teach this. We got another service, but let me just say, I believe that Jesus is coming back again. I believe the church is gonna be raptured from the planet. I believe the world is gonna go into seven years of tribulation. I believe after the seven years will be a millennial reign of Christ. Satan will be bound up for a thousand years and will rule and reign with him. After a thousand years, Satan will be released. There's a battle of Armageddon. We'll see the antichrist and the false prophet and Satan, they rally together in the battle of Armageddon. By the way, we'll, we'll suit up for battle. Face paint, brave heart moment. We'll be dabbing each other up, chest bumping in this moment. And here's, we're ready to go to war against the demonic forces of hell. But I got good news for you. We suit up for battle, step into that moment. And Jesus does this right here. And it's over. That's how it goes down. Spoiler alert, Jesus wins. And we ain't even got to fight. He's the warrior. So when it says you will rule, it's that millennial rule and reign of Christ. In Revelation chapter three, verse five, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in the white garments and your name will never be blotted out of the book of life. That's good news for somebody today. The moment you give your life to Jesus, I need you to know your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. When you get to heaven, your name's in the book. RSVP by Jesus. And he wrote your name in that book 
with no eraser on top of that pen. And the ink that fills the fount of that pen is the blood of Jesus. You have been sealed and secured. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demon, nor present, nor future could ever separate you from the love of God. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Church of Philadelphia, he says, I will make you, verse 12, like a pillar, crazy, just there. The only ruins that are left at the Church of Philadelphia are three pillars, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Earthquakes have decimated that place. Can I tell you that there are earthquakes amongst us? I'm not talking about actual earthquakes. I'm talking about the tectonic plates that are shifting in our culture. And a lot of things are changing. But if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus and live for him, you'll be like a pillar that will withstand every shock wave that comes across. You'll have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And then this one last promise. Here's what he says to the church of Laodicea. If you'll come to me, I'll clothe you, cover your nakedness, put salve into your eyes. And not only this, you will be rich. You go, hey, what is he talking about? The church of Laodicea in that region was known for three things. Had a medical center that was known for an eye salve. It was known as a banking center, so there was a lot of wealth. And it was also known as a textile exporter of black wool. Laodicea was so confident in their own wealth and riches that they didn't need God. The church of Laodicea was a wealthy church that didn't need God. You know what Jesus tells them? You're broke, you're poor, you're naked, and you're blind. And he says, buy from me. Find the gold, not of this world, but the value from him. Allow him to open up the eyes of the blind. Allow him to clothe us in righteousness. And I love how this ends because I believe it's an invitation. In Revelation chapter three, verse 20, it says, behold, I stand at the door of knock. And if anyone hears, anyone hears, I will open the door, come into him, eat with him, and he with me. I believe one of the saddest pictures of the seven churches of Revelation is Revelation 3, verse 20, because Jesus is on the outside. If Jesus is having to knock on the door, he ain't inside the church. He's outside the church. And I need you to know here at CBC, we fling wide the doors of this place. Jesus, come rule and reign. Spirit of God, fill this place. Call and commission us to be people that do not change based upon what goes on around us. Let us stand strong like pillars. Allow the anointing of God on our life and the fullness of the Holy Spirit be on full display and allow us to walk as more than conquerors in Christ because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'll close with this. There was a father that was walking by a bedroom and his son was trying to go to sleep and the covers were up against his neck. He said, son, you want me to cut the lights out? He said, no, dad. He goes, I'm going to sleep with the lights on tonight. The father said to his son, he goes, uh, so you're scared of the dark? He goes, no, dad, like maybe, yes, I went to a retreat and my camp counselor didn't tell me ghost stories. My camp counselor told me demon stories. And he goes, dad, I'm freaked out. He goes, would you pray for me? He goes, absolutely, I'll pray for you. He goes, what do you want me to pray for? He goes, would you pray I won't be scared of the demons? And the father said this, don't miss this. He goes, I'll never pray that for you. He goes, dad, what do you mean? You won't pray that for me. He goes, no, 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 it's the wrong prayer. He goes, instead of me praying that you won't be scared of the demons, this is what I want to speak over you today. This is what I'm de declaring and decreeing over you today, CBC, that instead of you being afraid of the demons, that the demons, this is the prayer of the Father, that the demons will be scared of you. That every day you come up out of that bed, every day your feet hit the ground, every day you walk into that workplace, every day you go into that gym, every day you go into that campus, every day you go outside the four walls of the church, the moment that your foot hits the ground, there would be blessings and power and wisdom and anointing and destiny and calling and you walk into every place and you shift and change the atmosphere. Listen to me. Don't be lukewarm. Get to the source. Don't lose your first love. Don't be worldly. Don't be one way here and another way outside of here. God's called you. You got a calling on your life. Be who God called you to be. Change the world for the sake and glory of Jesus. Come on, get on your feet. Clap your hands. We glorify you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. God, help us to be the church you've called us to be. We need you. God, give us some fortitude and courage to stand. Not in a condemning way, but Jesus is the hope way grace and truth. 
With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to listen to me. If you need Jesus, prayer team, why don't you just join me right here at the front. If you need to give your life to Jesus and you're in the overflow space, we got some people standing there at the front as well, our prayer team. If you need to talk to somebody about, I want this Jesus, we would love nothing more than to open up God's word and go, this is how you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you, listen to me, if you don't know if your life were to end today, whether or not you go to heaven, eternity is too long to be wrong. Come and talk to one of these prayer partners. Let them take God's word and show you what it means to be saved. Let traffic get out of here. And I mean, listen, you can maximize your moment right now. Just let traffic go on and you get saved in Jesus' name right here. So Father God, I pray for courage for those that need to have these conversations. We bless you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you soon.